one of the reasons uh, I chose this particular subject for parental rights is because it's such a well-known story. I think you can come to it almost immediately and know who those, these people are. It doesn't require a whole lot of context for folks to immediately grasp what's going on in the picture. It's Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. And there are all kinds of little markers in the painting that indicate their identity. And so that pulls you in right away, and it gives you something to... Um, to, to place yourself as you, as you look at it so that you know kind of what you should be thinking about. And after you've done that, you're free to look around the picture and pick out little details and wonder about why they would be there, assuming that the painter has put them there on purpose and that there's a reason for everything in the painting. Um, you can start to ask yourself the question, well, why choose that particular thing? Mary's clothes are, are, I think, pretty unusual for what you would expect to find somebody wearing in those days. All blue like that. Is, the blue dye of the day was very labor-intensive. And um, it's unlikely that somebody uh, would have had such clothes on for traveling. But in order to very clearly identify who she is, I just dressed her completely in blue. And that I find her so symbolic of Israel and that salvation comes from the Jews, as they say in the Bible. <clears throat> that um, I really had a lot of fun taking the various blue dyes and creating these different shades. There are several different garments. She has a, a lighter blue silk head covering, a dark blue wrap, and something in between for her um, dress. Is that what you would call it? Um, and it's also a nod to the tradition of representing Mary clothed in blue. Now these three red flowers here in the bottom corner are what they call crown anemones, and they blossom all over Palestine. And I love the idea of a flower with a name like that being in a picture with Jesus. Um, and I also love the brilliant red of them, which plays off the red thread that holds Mary's dress together right here. Three represents the Trinity. And it also, these three beautiful little flowers have just sprung up in front of an upside down Corinthian capital from this tumble down Roman temple that they've sheltered in for the night. Um, symbolically, the thing is upended, and instead of the stone flower that's carved on the side of it, you have these beautiful little flowers springing up, and I think that creates a really beautiful contrast between God's providence and the pagan world full of all of its false gods, the idols um, that they housed in these temples. And this is a detail that's very difficult to see from back there, but there's a thistle here in the other corner, and in contrast with the flowers, uh, symbolizing the thistles and thorns that the ground brings forth after the curse, after the fall, and the hardship of living in the world, which they're facing right now, uh, and also Christ's crown and his suffering that he endures later at the end of his life. Um, And the other highly symbolic thing, I think, in here that's subtle, but you know, if you, if you really took the time to kind of measure things out a little bit, you would notice that this line formed by Joseph's staff is duplicated here in the way the character's shoulders and arms line up, creating that classical compositional triangle that you see in so many old paintings and framing these two characters very well in that stability. And Joseph, very symbolically, I think, anyway, halfway in and halfway out of the picture, standing guard keeping them within that 
stability that he's very vigilantly looking out for. And then he looks into the darker side of the, the world as represented by all of this for the trouble that might spring up at any time while the light of providence comes in from this side and illuminates the figures. A light which is unnatural because there's a um, evening sky behind them. I use models um, and Sometimes it's just a model of, of opportunity. I'll see somebody that looks like they'd be good for a painting, and so I just ask them to sit, and I dress them up and start putting them in different poses. I've used this model, uh, this young lady. Um, she's about 16, and she thought it was very funny that we're dressing her up this way. She, she's Jewish, and so the idea of being Mary was a, was a riot. But... <laughs> She was posing for a different painting altogether. We had her for uh, the presentation at the temple. And I just said, while we're here, why don't you sit down? And she sat on an ottoman and held the child. And she just assumed this pose. And it was so beautiful. Uh, you know, she's just very naturally uh, a composed person. She's very confident and um, intelligent and quiet. So she really just kind of fell into it very beautifully. And so... The fact that that worked out very well for this painting was just almost an afterthought. Um, he is the youth minister at St. Philip's Church, Charleston, South Carolina. And um, he had actually been studying uh, Joseph's, Joseph's life a little bit. He'd been looking into it, and so he was very interested in portraying the character. Again, it was just kind of something that was, it was a happy surprise really more than anything else um, that we found him because he he has that marvelous beard and he also likes to go hiking and things like that so he had wonderful dark skin and it just worked beautifully um, and the baby is a friend's adopted uh, child from Guatemala who had very nice skin and um, was the right age so we we put her in there, too. It's actually a girl baby called Libby. You know, I just needed a little bit of a stage for them to be on, a little something that gave a little bit of interest down here and created a contrast between this sandy soil, this clay uh, that they're standing on, and the background. I just really put in there for interest more than anything else. Tiepolo, one of my heroes, of narrative painting used a device like that a lot in pictures and it works very well to give the uh, characters a little bit of a stage to stand on. Anybody else? A couple of months. I worked for about two months on the painting in the actual studio but again putting together all the models and things like that I'd say six months and thinking about it took about a year. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yeah, I've got a number of things uh, in the studio, and I like to keep more than one thing going, so that uh, when there is dead time, I can keep producing. Do you have a gallery down there? No, sir. No. Well, I'm a portrait artist. Mostly, that's what I've been doing, and uh, so that's my bread and butter. And this was uh, an interest that I just pursue whenever I have time to do it. We took this thing down to, can you hold it up for me? Yep. We took this painting down to Georgia and had it photographed down there. And these people down there did a beautiful job of um, recreating the, the, the colors and the feel of the painting, I think. Um, this is a lithograph print. Uh, we had a thousand of them printed. And um, I'm really pleased with the way things turned out. Um, and this is offered for sale on um, parental, parentalrights.org website, um, as well as these, uh, what they call G-clay prints, which are prints done on canvas that can be treated the same way as a painting. Uh, this needs to be put behind glass, but the prints on canvas can be framed up just like that. Um, I was very happy with the way they turned out.
one of the things that I want to try to do with my narrative painting is create an American tradition. And what the painters of Europe did, and one of the reasons you can so easily tell where a painting in Europe might have originated, is just by looking at the models and the settings of the characters. Uh, Rembrandt would use the people from around his town, and he would put them in places that were very easily recognizable from his hometown. And the Italian painters did the same thing. Uh, what I chose for my presentation at the, uh, at the temple painting of these characters is St. Philip's Church in downtown Charleston, because I think it's just a very easily recognizable scene. And it lets people know that they're not just looking at another uh, European painting. This is something that happened in America. And aside from the whole art historical context of that, what that does is it, I think it brings the painting into uh, people's lives by showing them the story happening in a, in a place that they're familiar with, a place that um, a place that they've perhaps seen uh, in person. And I think that in that way, the picture is done in the spirit of the Gospels, because the Gospels are about ordinary people. It's about God's intervention in, in your life, in, in your daily life. And so that's part of what I'm trying to do with using the ordinary as they did in the Baroque tradition in the paintings. Okay, the clothing, um, we made it in part, and the other half of the clothing came from um, the thrift store. We would find a paint, we would find a, a piece of clothing that was very simple that we could very easily uh, bleach and then dye and alter, and um, we just used the various things that looked like they would fit and put them together in such a way that um, got across the idea of ancient garb. And what it is, again, it's one of those things, it's a little bit of a compromise between authenticity uh, of ancient dress and the sort of thing that you would expect Mary to be dressed in, just from your experience of other pictures. You know, if I were to burden the characters with 100% purely authentic costumes, to the best of my knowledge, it might almost act as a distraction from what's happening in the picture. That you would spend a lot of time looking at the jewelry and the intricacies of this and that, and it would remove the characters from you in a way that I think would be harmful to the picture. The story has to come first. The story has to really shine through in a way that isn't obstructed by anything else. So you kind of walk a line between several things when you when you try to put something like this across. Artistic license, but for a good purpose, I think. Why I picked this particularly for parental rights and what I thought about it is, again, it is something that is very familiar to people, and it's a. I wanted to make it a pretty picture as well. Um, so I tried to make the characters as appealing as possible and give people something that they could immediately identify as the as the Holy Family, but I was drawing a parallel and trying to draw a parallel between the persecution of this ancient family and the idea of families today, here or now in America, being persecuted by forces that are a lot stronger than they are, by, by people who would come between children and their parents in a harmful way, uh, perhaps not as dramatic as uh, Herod and the Massacre of the Innocents, but uh, I think that the strength of that story behind these characters is balanced by the relative peace of the, um, the scene in the picture.